Joji has one of the most beautiful voices of any pop singer around today. But even more than that, his style, his inspirations, his visuals, and songwriting are all unique. He's a huge breath of fresh air in today's overwhelmingly commercial music industry. The way he mixes melancholy melodies with edgy, even disturbing lyrics has elevated him to be a highly successful artist. There's a reason why he's made some of the biggest songs in the last five years, despite having a pretty minimal social media presence. But where does he come from and what makes Joji's music so special? If you're interested in more of my creations, I just launched a series of pendants that I designed from scratch. Each necklace is made of full 925 sterling silver with enamel paint in the design of a sun rising over a night full of silver stars. To me, the necklaces serve as a reminder that whoever you are and whatever your goal is, whether it's business, content creation, school, music, the only way to reach your goals is to just keep going. Because there cannot be any light without dark. There cannot be any success without struggling first. If you want to support my work and buy a necklace, feel free to pick one up at the link below. Shipping is free in the United States, and every necklace comes with a handwritten note. Shipping begins in late December. To buy a necklace, go to volksgeist.store. Joji grew up in Japan for the first 18 years of his life, and that experience is a big part of what inspires his musical style. When he talks about living in Japan for his whole childhood, he says that the environment he grew up in remains one of his biggest inspirations for music. He grew up in Osaka, a coastal city surrounded by mountains, and he says that as a kid he would play around water all the time, running through rice fields with his friends, catching frogs, and building an appreciation for quiet, peaceful things. And I think you can hear that sense of calm, idyllic atmosphere in a lot of Joji's music. Even when the songs are sad, they often feel ethereal and peaceful. When Joji talks about his early experiences with making music, even though he would eventually become most well-known for his singing, production and instrumentation were really important to him early on. Because a lot of people don't know that Joji produces most of his own music, including some of his all-time biggest hits like Slow Dancing in the Dark. Anyway, back as a teenager, Joji tried to learn almost every instrument, everything from ukuleles to piano to guitar and drums. And while he says he didn't master any of them, learning all of these basics gave him a really good foundation for learning how to make music later on. When he was in Japan, Joji also learned how to use GarageBand, which would go on to become an extremely important part of his creative process even to this day as he was able to maximize its features to create a complex sound with a pretty minimal set of tools. Joji moved to the United States when he was 18 to go to college in New York City, and it was only a few years after that that he got involved in the online lo-fi hip-hop scene. If you don't know a lot about the lo-fi hip-hop scene, I would say it's really not all that bad, but it was full of a lot of generic and uninspired stuff that ended up giving the genre a kind of bad reputation. You know, lo-fi music was music for people who wear beanies and vans and hipster glasses and have shitty beards. In reality though, lo-fi hip-hop tends to not be very melodically adventurous, sonically interesting, or all that meaningful in general. There is some really good lo-fi hip-hop, but it's mostly always been background music. But the music Joji made during his lo-fi producer era might actually be some of the best lo-fi hip-hop I've ever heard. There are songs like Medicine and Tom that just feel incredibly nostalgic with smooth, beautiful production. Honestly, the only bad part of the song Tom from 2015 is the little hip-hop rapping pink guy style verse that he added in before bursting into an airy falsetto halfway through the song. You can really hear his talent in these early songs, but at the same time he was still figuring out his delivery and production, and it's easy to see why people still love this work from very, very early in his process, both because it's pretty good, and it also definitely has some nostalgia too. The thing is, at the same time Joji was blowing up as an artist, he was also one of the most popular YouTubers in the world, and he had been for years, with a comedy channel featuring a number of different personas played by Joji himself, including Filthy Frank and Pink Guy. The videos featured offensive comedy songs, extreme shock humor, and a wide range of some of the most disgusting moments in internet history. Joji created the Harlem Shake meme, he made videos like Pimp My Wheelchair, Hair Cake, the Shut the Fuck Up song, a song called Kill Yourself. All of it was insanely popular, 
but it's probably not something he could get away with anymore. I think at a certain point, Joji decided that's not how he wanted his lasting legacy to look. Even though a lot of people loved Filthy Frank and Pink Guy and the comedy rap mixtapes, he felt like he had more to offer as an artist and wanted to move into a new medium. When Joji finally quit working on the Filthy Frank and Pink Guy videos and songs, he talked about how he had no choice but to move on from those projects because of the stress it was causing him. Having to film all the time and being so much in the public eye was causing legitimate health issues. But just a month after quitting Filthy Frank Forever, Joji announced the first ever official Joji project, In Tongues. And to me personally, In Tongues is a truly iconic piece of music. Even though it isn't as well produced as the projects Joji would create later, even though the vocals are raw and rough, there's something deeply inspiring about the way Joji was able to completely leave behind his old persona and dive into a new identity. In Tongues has such a powerful, personal, devastating sound that it allowed Joji to leave behind who he had been before and become a whole new artist in a way that would change his life forever. In Tongues is a masterpiece in many ways, and I think a huge part of its success was the fact that Joji created a strong visual look for the project because it came out during a time when the phrase YouTuber music was most strongly associated with something like this. Remind me of my cereal from Britain when I see her, I'm like Cheerio. Yeah, Alyssa called asking me if we could stay bro with the Disney Channel flow. Five mil on YouTube in six months, never done before. Pest all the competition, man. It was only a few months before Joji dropped Will He and Demons that Jake Paul and Ricegum were making piles of money making some of the worst songs of all time, and it was clear that Joji was going to have to put in a lot of work to avoid being lumped in with every other YouTuber making shitty music for a quick bag. And I think the visuals Joji came up with for In Tongues helped a lot with him being taken seriously instead of people just discounting him as making sad emo music for attention on the internet. So when Will He popped up with that visual of Joji laying in a bathtub full of blood with a dark vintage look, and the Demons music video which was strange bordering on disturbing with a monster chained to the bottom of an empty swimming pool, it wasn't just well produced but it was mysterious, strange, and kind of disturbing. It didn't feel like a YouTuber transitioning to a half-hearted, overly corporate music career. It felt weird, unexpected, and totally new. The In Tongues EP as a whole is full of some amazing songs that all kind of follow a common sound. Will He is a sorrowful track with soft, heartbroken piano melodies. World Star Money has a nostalgic ukulele with one of Joji's all-time most vulnerable performances as he reaches one of the most comfortable sounding falsettos of his career to that point. I think some of the songs on this EP aren't so great. Maybe these days they sound a little bit too 2017, a little bit too much lo-fi beats, not enough memorable melodies, but they all have this kind of heavy feeling of oppressive heartbreak that would go on to become one of the trademarks of Joji's style. And In Tongues ended up being a streaming monster over the next few years, even though it wasn't huge on the charts. There are songs on here with hundreds of millions of streams, and Joji was quickly becoming considered a full-on legitimate musical artist, not just a YouTuber making music. And since he was able to do that, it was becoming clear that if he could find new fans who had no idea he had ever been a YouTuber in the first place, then the sky would be the limit. Ballads 1, the first of Joji's three studio albums, came out just 11 months after In Tongues, and in my opinion, it's pretty much a masterpiece. Even though Ballads 1 is Joji's first studio album, it includes what might be the most successful song he's ever made. Slow Dancing in the Dark went five times platinum, and it proved for the first time that Joji could have massive star power and go far, far above and beyond the memes and the jokes that had made him popular in the first place. I think I would describe Ballads 1 as a more polished example of what made the emotional melodic SoundCloud scene so good back in the day. With a trippy red feature and a wide range of producers collaborating with Joji from Clams Casino to Shlomo, it feels like a genuine tribute to the lo-fi low-budget sound of that era. And it's also aged a lot better than some projects from that time have. At the same time, the song structure and melodies and hooks and lyrics were so catchy that the album ended up being hugely commercially successful despite having a radically minimal sound. While you can pretty much hear that Joji produced most of the project himself on GarageBand, it still features some really amazing deep production on songs like Attention, Come Through, R.I.P., and I'll See You at 40. There's a lot of really powerful emotion on here, but I still think it falls short in that you can hear Joji was really still learning how to sing and make tracks stand out. 
The best song structures and vocals of Joji's career were yet to come, and I think there are some duds on this project. If you look through the aesthetics and actually ask yourself how many of these tracks are memorable, there are some that just don't stick with you. But at the same time, this was a really successful project with billions of streams, and it practically made Joji a household name as a pop singer, with Slow Dancing in the Dark being ridiculously popular when it came out. And of course, the album was accompanied by some amazing music videos, including the Slow Dancing in the Dark video, which has 350 million views and features a heartbroken Joji wandering through the street with goat legs and a tuxedo, continuing the tradition of Joji having incredible visuals on his albums. Joji's second album, Nectar, was an upgrade in every way. The whole record sounds bigger and better, and from the very opening moment of the intro track, Ew, the cinematic crescendos and strings in Joji's falsetto just blow you away with how much better they sound than ever before. And the next song, Modus feels the same way. Joji really set a new tone on this album with the immense instrumental beauty of most of these songs. Tracks such as Like You Do, Sanctuary, Run, Gimme Love, Daylight, a lot of this album is absolutely iconic. This record also feels much less emo than his previous work. It's more poppy and more commercial, while also having some beautiful piano production and a lot of ballads. And yeah, there are some songs on Nectar that I don't like that much. The songs that I do like, I absolutely love. Joji developed such an ability for making songs that tug at your heart that the tracklist on Spotify literally looks like a greatest hits album. There are so many streams. Between Nectar and Now, Joji became a living legend. He completely broke free of his old career and became a true pop star without giving up the feelings of raw sadness and morbidity that made his music so unique to begin with. I think Joji had always put that deep heartbreak and introspection into his music, and he wasn't about to give that up and sell out to get more popular. What he wanted to do was hone that craft and make the best heartbreaking sad love songs he could possibly make. Songs such as Like You Do feel so real, yet grand and large at the same time, and I think Nectar features a lot of Joji's best tracks. Lately, I can't help but think that our roads might take us down different phase. Smithereens is Joji's latest project, and it's definitely a distinct evolution compared to Nectar. Smithereens is barely over 20 minutes long, but its lead single, Glimpse of Us, surpassed Slow Dancing in the Dark to become yet another record breaking song for Joji, charting at number one in multiple countries and becoming the second ever song by a Japanese artist to chart in the top 10 in the United States with almost a billion streams in just six months. And you can hear exactly why it's so incredibly popular. Glimpse of Us is one of the most beautiful pop songs to come out in the last five years, at least, and it's a breathtaking culmination of all the sounds Joji has been working on for years. She'd take the world off my shoulders If it was ever to move He's finally created the perfect, sorrowful, heartbroken, sentimental ballad with the most tragic lyrics and the most painful delivery. Smithereens is full of minimal, spacey, piano-based production on songs like Die For You, 1AM Freestyle, and Dissolve. And when you listen to this record, you just can't help but recognize how incredibly skilled Joji has become since his debut. You can trace his progression through his releases and hear how his voice is just so much better than it used to be in every way. And because of that, I think Smithereens has some more lo-fi electronic style songs that just aren't that remarkable compared to the mind-blowing quality of the ballads. So when I imagine what I think Joji should do next, my first thought is, wow, he should really work on a more dramatic, more sentimental album that's full of songs of the same quality as Glimpse of Us. That's how Joji would get an award nomination or a classic album. Because Glimpse of Us has almost 700 million streams on Spotify alone. His success seems almost unbelievable when you look at just how quiet his persona is. Because he is genuinely ridiculously famous. He's in the top five most streamed artists on Spotify, and he's playing some of the biggest, best venues in the world. Madison Square Garden, Gunnersbury Park, venues with capacities of 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 people. Joji has made it. He started as a college kid making memes on YouTube, and he somehow ended up one of the most successful pop singers of his generation. And Joji is one of the most successful Asian musicians of all time when it comes to the Western market. 
Joji's success over the last five years has been incredible. And even more important than that, he never gave up on his vision. From the mysterious, enigmatic, unofficial Chloe Burbank music to his early Joji songs like I Don't Wanna Waste My Time and Will He, he's slowly become an iconic singer and producer without ever giving up the atmosphere of surreal heartbreak that veers between nightmarish and bittersweet nostalgia at the same time. And I really believe that five, 10, or 20 years from now, when people have moved on, when this time in our lives becomes a distant memory, when you forget this video, when you forget this week and this month and all you have left is distant, hazy memories that become less clear as time passes, Joji will be one of the few artists whose music doesn't have an expiration date. He will be one of the few artists who could come on the radio and make you stop what you're doing to just listen and remember as the memories come flooding back through his ethereal melodies. And to me, Joji's ultimate strength is the way he can channel the vulnerability of his vocals and lyrics remind us deeply of the real human cost of time. Things change, people leave, and nothing stays the same. But there's still beauty and loss, and in the pursuit of chasing a better future, even if you have to make deep sacrifices to find it. Which, in reality, is what everyone has to do if you want to live fulfilling lives. That's why I feel like even though so many of Joji's songs seem to be about heartbreak, they can apply to so much more. Like the universal experience of all people that our lives cannot be improved without first suffering through the change it takes to get there. This has been Volksgeist. I'm Philip, and thank you for watching. And of course, don't forget that my brand new necklace, The Darkest Night and the Brightest Day, is now available at volksgeist.store with free shipping in the US. And since you watched this far into the video, you can use the code VOLKSGANG for $5 off. Thank you so much for your support.